So far, we have used displacements, or relative locations between points, as our intuition for what geometric vectors represent. In fact, we have used our intuitive understanding for how displacements work to come up with our rules for adding geometric vectors and multiplying them by numbers. Now we're wondering, what else works like geometric vectors? What other kinds of objects can be thought of as directed segments and satisfy the same rules for addition and multiplication by numbers? Well, in this video, we'll consider several such examples. We'll say a little bit more about displacements, and then we'll talk about velocities, accelerations, and forces, the most surprising example of the four. So what else do we have to say about displacements that we haven't already said? Remember that we also refer to displacements as journeys, and that's a very nice intuitive way of thinking about things. And whenever we consider journeys, we thought of them as sequential actions. Remember, we would start at a particular point, and then the first journey would take us here, and then the second journey will take us from here to here. And of course, this vector represents the net result of the two journeys, and it's the geometric sum of these two vectors by the tip-to-tail rule. So great! The thing that I would like for you to realize now, and that will be key to understanding velocities in just a moment, is that those actions need not be sequential. They can be concurrent. Here's one example illustrating that. Consider a train that's moving up at 60 miles an hour, and we'll consider this motion over a period of time of one hour, so t equals one hour, so the train will have moved 60 miles. And while the train is moving, there is a ladybug going from crawling from this location to this location right here. And it goes at 60 inches an hour. So in that same hour, it will have moved 60 inches. Okay, great. What we want to determine is the net displacement of the ladybug with respect to the surrounding stationary objects. So what is the ladybug's net journey? And it is, of course, the sum of the two individual displacements. The displacement of the ladybug with respect to the train car, and also the displacement of the train car with respect to the surrounding stationary objects, which is best captured by this vector. You can anchor it anywhere you want. I just chose it somewhere lined up with the front of the car, and of course it went from the front of where the car used to be to the front of where the car now. And the net displacement of the ladybug itself with respect to the surrounding objects is, well, it ended up here, right? So it started out right here, and it ended up right here. So that's the net displacement, and it is captured by this vector right here. Not bad. And the question is, does, the net dis does this net displacement equal the sum of these two individual displacements? And the answer is, yes, of course it is. And you can see by the tip-to-tail rule, if you just mentally move this vector right here, it would be the exact same vector. And so this net displacement is the sum of the two displacement, the displacement of the train with respect to the surrounding object and the displacement of the ladybug with respect to the train car. So the rule for adding vectors together works even when the actions, movements, are not sequential, even when they are concurrent. So let's now capture this fact algebraically, and you can think about how nice it is while I'm writing this down. We have to give these vectors some names, so we'll call this vector B for bug, we'll call this vector C for car, and this vector D for displacement. That's not bad nomenclature. So we can write that D equals B plus C. So the tip to tail rule, our fundamental rule for adding geometric vectors, continues to work even when the displacements are concurrent. Now let's talk about velocities. In this example, there are three velocities at play. There's the velocity of the train, there's the velocity of the ladybug with respect to the train car, and then there is the absolute velocity of the ladybug with respect to the stationary objects outside the train. 
And the question that we want to answer is where that last velocity, the absolute velocity of the ladybug, is the sum of its velocity with respect to the train car and the velocity of the train. So you may pause the video and think about this question, but I'll give you my explanation and the answer will be yes. So first of all, velocity is a vector. Velocity has a direction and a magnitude and, is a, and it is obtained from displacement by dividing displacement by the elapsed time. And that of course assumes that everything is uniform. So throughout the discussion, we assume that the motion was uniform. The train, the velo uh, excuse me, the motion of the train was uniform and the motion of the ladybug across the train car was uniform as well. Then we can say that the absolute velocity of the ladybug is this vector d divided by the elapsed time t. So let me write it right here, d divided by the elapsed time t, and this of course is a vector. And I won't draw this vector because of course these vectors have their own scale. So important to realize that these vectors have lengths that are measured in miles or kilometers. And therefore velocities are vectors whose lengths are measured in kilometers per hour or miles per hour. So they have their own scale because they come in different units. So in order to draw these vectors, we have to decide on what the unit length is. And then depending on what we call the unit vector, we'll scale these vectors appropriately. Now when we draw velocity vectors, we have to decide on what length vector represents one kilometer. Let's stick to metric units. One kilometer per hour. And then scale all of the other velocity vectors proportionally. But the thing to realize is it's important to realize that whatever lengths those vectors would be if we actually drew them, those lengths are proportional to the lengths of these vectors because we're just dividing these vectors by the same common time period t. So we'll talk about the velocity vectors, but we won't draw them separately. You can even think of these drawings as representing velocities as well because they're proportional to those velocities and because our choice of unit one kilometer an hour vector is arbitrary. So let's choose it to be the same length as one kilometer. Then the two sets of vectors would coincide. So I just don't want to make the picture unnecessarily messy. So the velocity, the overall velocity of the ladybug is d over t. Now let's recall that d is of course b plus c. So let's plug it in. We're going to write it as one over t b plus c. So this is the overall velocity of the ladybug. Now we're going to use the distributive law and that will be the key as to why velocities also add up like the vectors do. That's why the distributive law is so important. So according to the distributive law we can just multiply this out and it will become b over t plus c over t by the distributive law, by the distributive property. And what have we ended up with? Well, this right here is the velocity of the bug with respect to the train car. And this right here is the velocity of the train with respect to the surrounding objects. So yes, the net, the absolute velocity of the bug is the sum of the two individual velocities that the bug is subject to. Right? When the bug is moving on the train, it's experiencing two velocities with respect to the train and along with the train with respect to the surrounding objects. And we have just shown that the velocity, the individual velocities add up to give the net velocities. So velocities, thanks to the distributive law, also obey the same rule for addition and probably multiplication by numbers as the displacement vectors are. So we have arrived at the conclusion that we were seeking. Now let's briefly talk about acceleration. Uh, now we would have to go away from the situation where velocities were constant, <clears throat> assuming they were changing according to some rule, maybe changing uniformly. We could repeat the same discussion and realize that we have to uh, divide the change in time, excuse me, the change in velocity by time and that will be acceleration. 
So it will be largely the same discussion, except we will be dividing by t again, things that add up according to the rules of geometric vectors, and we would arrive at the same conclusion. There would be some subtleties, there would be some details to clarify, but right now we just want to capture the big picture. And our conclusion, once all of those details are worked out, would be the same. Yes, accelerations also satisfy the rule, the same rules for addition and multiplication by numbers as geometric vectors. So we can think now of displacements, velocities, and accelerations as geometric vectors to satisfy those wonderful rules for addition and multiplication by numbers. So now let's talk about forces. Let me erase what I have on the board so far and talk about forces. All right, I have written down Newton's celebrated law, F equals ma, the net force equals mass times acceleration. And the first and most important thing to notice about this formula is that it involves vector quantities. That's why understanding geometric vectors is key to understanding mechanics and probably much of physics. So let's start on the right hand side where we have acceleration. And we have just discussed accelerations and we acknowledge that accelerations act just like geometric vectors. They're directed segments and they obey the same rules for addition and multiplication by numbers. Let's pretend that we know what mass means and focus on the left hand side, the net force. Now what does Newton mean by the net force? Any physical body at any time experiences several influences. For example, if I were to lean on the blackboard, you could say that I'm experiencing three forces. Uh, gravity, a uh, force on behalf of the blackboard, and the force on behalf of the floor. And Newton invites us to evaluate the net force, because it is the net force that will determine acceleration. You would have to, to divide the net force by the mass of the body, and that will give us acceleration, and we already know what acceleration means. Now what does he mean by the net force? That's the very interesting question, which in the example I just gave was presumably zero because my acceleration was zero. I wasn't going anywhere. Okay, so what is net force? So Newton is actually saying many more things than meet the eye in this equation. First of all, he's saying that velocities, excuse me, that forces, because they're matched up with accelerations, are also directed segments or else we wouldn't have, wouldn't be able to have an equality. So forces are directed segments. Perhaps that's consistent with our intuition because when we apply a force, we do it with certain strength and in a certain direction. So let's accept, and of course over the last 300 years we got used to this, that forces do act as directed segments. Now what does he mean by a net force? For example, if we looked at a body subject to three forces, how do you calculate the net force? What do you mean? Well, Newton would say just add them together. And the right question to push back 300 years ago would have been, what do you mean add them together? I understand how to add numbers. Now you're springing this new kind of thing on me, directed segments, how do I add them together? And Newton's response would of course be, you add them together according to the parallelogram rule. You add them like you would geometric vectors. And the reasonable question will be, well, who is to say that forces add up to the rule by which geometric vectors add up? Who is to say that? Why, why do forces add up by the parallelogram rule? It's not at all obvious or intuitive that that's how forces would add up. So the best, the best answer to the question, why do forces add up to the parallelogram rule, is because Newton said so. And Newton had a closer relationship with God than any one of us ever will, and he seems to have known what he was talking about. So since Newton and Newton's postulating that that's how forces operate, we accept the fact that forces add up like geometric vectors, and it seems to describe nature quite well. 
It is very different from the way we've treated displacements, velocities, and accelerations. Because the fact that displacements add up according to the parallelogram rule uh, kind of makes sense, it is intuitive, and it's also really the inspiration for that definition in the first place. Now, given that rule for addition, we concluded that velocities and accelerations also satisfy, can also be added according to that rule. But there is no way, I believe, to derive the same property for forces. For forces, it is just postulated, and it was postulated by Newton. So you see just how much more, how much more geometry and mathematics went into this formula, especially 300 years ago when all of this was so new. How much more went into this formula than actually meets the eye? And how much human thought and experience went into defining and working with geometric vectors? We're kind of taking it for granted now, and I don't blame anybody. It, the, it's a good thing to take for granted, but it's also a good thing to sometimes look back into history, which is so difficult to reconstruct, but you can construct your own idea of how things developed and realize just how much work, intelligence, and really genius went into these definitions. And also to know that if you're struggling with these concepts, that it's perfectly okay. Because number one, it took Newton to realize how things work, someone like Newton. And it's also taken us 300 some years to get used to it to the point that we are now. So in any case, this completes this video in which we discuss how many other types of objects act just like geometric vectors, which should really raise the utility of geometric vectors in our minds.